Well, hello and uh, welcome again. We are continuing to dig through James 4, 1 to 10. It's been a very intense week. If you are somebody who's paying attention and watching the news, obviously throughout our world, there is always intense things going on. But in recent days, it's felt like there's more happening in our part of the world, our backyard, so to speak. And yet these events that are happening remind us that there is continually pain and there is continual brokenness happening, being created all around the world. And, you know, sometimes we feel like uh, when, when intense things happen, we think, oh, we've got to find we got to find some scripture to, to talk about that, to pay attention to that. And I'm not saying at all that that's a bad idea. But I'm amazed, and I'm amazed in a unique way this week, in, in this reality that we know that we believe that scripture is living and active. This, 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 um, this collection of the revelation of God to humanity, written over 1,500 years, about 40 authors, continues to speak to us. God grabs it by his Holy Spirit. And, and he, he gives it to us. He activates it in our lives. And, and I, I really hope, I just want to say this at the beginning, I hope that you have a personal scripture habit. I hope that you are somebody who opens the world. We live in a, in a society where we are free to open the word and read it and invite God to speak to us. And I, I hope you have a habit where you read a passage or a chapter or two or maybe three or four daily and you say, God, speak to me. And I hope that you've had the experience that so many have day after day, how whatever we're walking through, God takes his word and he speaks through it to us. And as church, we have a scripture habit. <laughs> it, it, it's not that we aren't going to at times take topics and talk about them, but we want to, in a disciplined way, walk through scripture and say to the Lord by studying scripture, what do you want to say to me today? I've had a number of times where people have said to me, you know, it was absolutely amazing. I'm going through this struggle in my life and I opened up to the reading that was assigned to me in my daily reading and it talked about exactly what I'm going through. And I will always say to people, maybe I've said this to you, I'll say, you know, it, it's almost like scripture is living and active. <laughs> and I just want to encourage you in that, that God speaks to his children and the primary way he speaks with clarity is when his Holy Spirit brings scripture to life. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you in that habit. And as we think about the things going on in our society, on our continent in this time, it's amazing to me that the scripture that we picked, hopefully with the Lord's leading months ago, starts with these words, what causes fights and quarrels among you, and then goes on to talk about where do fights and quarrels come from, and how big of a deal are they, and, and importantly, what do we do with them? What are the solution? What, what is the solution? And this scripture, I'm just going to warn you. I'm just going to warn you that it's not going to allow us to point our fingers at other people. This scripture is going to identify the fact that there is brokenness and pain, and deep injustice in our world. And it's going to call each of us to respond. Now, this is not a light-hearted topic at all, but a light-hearted story that I think gives a good picture of somebody taking credit when they deserved credit for something bad. Uh, years ago, 20 years ago, in, in our church, uh, I was involved with helping to lead the young adult group. And I remember this night, we were having a young adult Bible study. We were in this small 1950s home, probably 30 people jammed into this tiny living room, you know, almost sitting on top of each other, doing a Bible study, talking, introducing ourselves, praying for one another. And in this small, warm room in the summer, all of a sudden, um, there's no way to really say this correctly on video for a sermon, but somebody let one go. There was a little flatulence. There was a fart. And, 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 you know, in a, in a young adult kind of context, you know, maybe in every context, but especially in a young adult context, everybody's trying to look their best. Everybody's got their eye on two or three or four people that they think maybe that's going to be my future spouse. And all of a sudden, it was like the air was sucked out of the room and everybody was thinking the same thing. Who did that? It was really an awkward situation. And after just a couple moments of awkward silence, there was one young man kind of kneeling up against the wall and humbly and a little sheepishly, uh, he, he put up his hand and he looked around at everybody and he said, uh, that was me. 
<laughs> and it was this beautiful moment because everybody started laughing, of course. And, you know, nobody wants that to be them, but he almost became the hero of the day. It was just so well-timed and so funny and so beautiful that it became this thing that whenever situations like that happened in our home of bachelors, we would, you know, put up our hand and say, that was me. It became kind of a fun thing. But in this passage, we are called to remember. We're called to remember the story of what is going on in our world. The story of the beauty of creation, the story of the fall of humanity into sin, every single one of us. The, the story of the redemption of the Savior, Jesus Christ, coming from heaven, dying in our place for our forgiveness, rising again to our hope, and, and to be those who put up our hands and say, I, I am implicated in this story. I, I am a person who needs to respond with humility, owning the part that I ha, have made. It. It's, it's, it's not that, it's, that other people, it's not their problem too, but first, it's me. I need to look at me. And we have this beautiful picture in Revelation. John read a little later from Revelation. But we have this beautiful reminder that speaks into our world today. It speaks into injustice. It speaks into racism. And it reminds us what the kingdom of God is like. It's this vision of revelation that we believe. This is what God is doing. God is tearing down walls. He is tearing down the walls of hostility that divide us one from another for whatever reason. And we see in Revelation 7 that John looks and he sees there before him was a great multitude that no one could count. This is, this is the group of believers at the end of time worshiping God. And this is what it says. It says, from every nation, from every tribe, from every people, from every language, standing before the throne of God. They were, they were singing together, all dressed in white, purified by God, crying out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is a beautiful picture of what our hearts long for. Yes, we long for justice, but greater than that, we long for heaven. This place where the brokenness of this world is no more, where God has made everything new. We long for heaven, and the path towards it is Jesus Christ. So we're going to look into this. In the previous chapter, we read that those who are truly wise pursue peace. Really powerful application in last week's passage. This week's passage starts with, what causes fights and quarrels among you? If the truly wise pursue peace, and if there are fights and quarrels among you, what's up? And again, this passage will push at these questions. Where does injustice come from? In James's church that he's writing to, there was a real separation between the rich and the poor, and the rich were exerting their power and oppressing the poor in the church. And he was speaking to them throughout the whole book saying, this should not be. Where does it come from? How big of a deal is it when we're operating, especially as followers of Christ, when we're operating in this way? And what's the solution to it? So first, where does it come? Verses 1 to 3 of chapter 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. First, our selfish passions damage our relationships and our society. What is the source of all this? What is the source of the damage to our society? Of all the injustice, it is our selfish passions. It is our sin. We have desires. You could translate these Greek words passions. You could even translate them cravings. This, this word that talks about an incredibly physical feeling of desire. And the question that these verses ask of us is what are we doing with our desires? And there is a path where we take these things into our own hands. You and I feel things. We want things. We desire things. We crave things. Path one is that we take these things into our own hands. And James tells us that when we do this, when we, have, when we desire things that we don't have, when we covet things that we can't get, this is a very dangerous thing. When we nurture that, when we go after it in our own strength, our own ambition, over time it becomes fights. It can even become quarrels. It can even become murder. 
But in all of this, when we go after our desires, pleasure, status, wealth, whatever, they don't bring us what we actually want. And they reveal a deeper conflict within us. Our external conflicts reveal an inner conflict with God. Our fights with one another indicate a fight in our hearts with God. And even if we kill, even if we go all the way to get that desire and we actually take the life of another human being, it is not ultimately satisfying. I remember one of the first times I was freed from the, from the bondage of the home I grew up in. I'm saying that tongue in cheek, the great home I grew up in. But I went to a junior high church retreat. They had free pop with no limits. I never experienced this in my house. And I drank over 20 pops in one night. And that night I did not sleep. And I felt terrible. I went after it and it was not satisfying. I remember in grade 11 this conflict rising between two people in my class. And ultimately it became an intense fist fight with a circle of people watching. I remember watching the bigger and stronger one just pummel the smaller one. And even when he went to the floor, continue to hit and continue to hurt. And you look at that, you go, okay, at the end of that, are you satisfied now? Does that put the things you long for in your hearts, the fullness, the health, the wholeness, the flourishing, the shalom, does that fill your heart? Was he happy? No, of course he wasn't. When we take our pleasures, our desires into our own hands, it breaks things. But the other path is taking them to God. James says this so simply. You don't have, you have these passions, you have these desires, but you don't, you don't have what you want. Why? Because you don't ask God. The second path is instead of trying to get them on our own, surrendering them to God and saying, God, this is, this is what's going on in my heart. This is what's happening in my heart. You know, the reality is our desires oppose each other. We want a variety of things and we, we, we can't have them all. But shalom is what God is up to. When we go to him, we've talked about how shalom is flourishing and wholeness and health and fullness in every way, like a bubbling brook with trees and plants growing up on every side. This is what God is up to. And when we bring our desires, whatever they are to him, and we lay them at his feet, we say, God, not, not our way towards these, but yours. He is faithful. He says, you do not have because you don't ask God. And when you do ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. We, we don't ask, first off. We don't put those things in God's hands. We resent. We get bitter. We're envy, selfish ambition, and it turns into this stuff. And then often, even when we do ask, we're asking selfishly. We're saying, God, give me that Lamborghini, you know. And he says, you're not going to get in that situation either. Prayer is a better place to take our hurts. Prayer is a better place to take our desires, are you envying? Are you feeling jealous? Are you bitter? Are you, are you hurt? Take it to God. It's a better place to take it. And scripture reveals repeatedly that God answers prayer, period. Where does injustice in our world come from? It, it comes from the sin in our hearts. And when that is multiplied over hundreds and thousands and billions of people, it becomes the brokenness that we experience in society. What are you doing with your desires? Secondly, how big of a deal is all this? Well, listen how James talks about it in verses 4 and 5. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity? Enmity means active hostility and opposition. Friendship with the world means enmity against God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Second, when we flirt with the world, we cheat on God. When we flirt with the world, we cheat on God. James, James makes this a marriage analogy, and I think this is helpful. Because sometimes we can think, well, I didn't really, what, what I did, it wasn't really that big of a deal. Let me tell you what the other person did. And when James brings back this biblical analogy of, of God and his people being like a husband-wife relationship, in the Old Testament, he said, I am the husband of Israel. In the New Testament, the church is called the bride of Christ. When he brings it into the realm of marriage, we ask this question, what level of cheating is okay in a marriage? And, and a second question is, 
what does cheating do to a marriage? And the answer is no level of cheating is okay in a marriage and all cheating damages a marriage. And I want to speak this to you, that the enemy only wants disorder, chaos, and tragedy. He's happy when things get to the point of being unraveled. That's the end of his plan. (laughs) When When there is destruction, when there is pain, when there is death, when there is hatred, when there is anger, when there is malice, when there is slander, the enemy is happy. When we flirt with the world, we cheat on God. You can't live for both. You can't run after your selfish desires and try to get them on your own and run after God. There is no middle ground. If you're going to run after the things that the world values, you cannot at the same time run after God. Enmity is active hostility and opposition. Now, we need to be careful with this. We need to be careful with this because we read here that we can't be friends with the world. As followers of Christ, as the bride of Christ, together as a church, we can't be friends with the world. You may be saying to yourself, but I thought God so loved the world (laughs) that he gave his only son. I thought Jesus ate with sinners. I thought thought Jesus shared his life with tax collectors, notorious sinners. And you would be right with all of those comments. And so the the, the, the word world is used in a variety of ways in the New Testament. But really what it means is all things, all people or systems that are opposed to God. And so we, we read, if we read scripture carefully and we bring these things together, we realize that this is the bullseye position as you bring these things together. Number one, God loves all people. God welcomes and accepts and invites all people. And so we are called to love all people. When James says, don't be a friend with the world, he is not saying, don't be friends with your next neighbor, next door neighbor. He's not saying, don't care about people who are marginalized in our society. The call uh, across all scripture, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. We are called to love. We are called to love. But secondly, what James is getting at is don't try to fit in and live by the, the, the systems of this world, the values of this world that are opposed to God. One commentator simply writes, the Bible often compels us to stand for values radically at odds with those of our culture. Paul writes, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation. Unbelievers are at a place where they are friends with the world. Those who have not submitted to the lordship of Christ. Where they live by the cultures and values and customs of this world. But as believers, James is saying to us, when we befriend the world, we cheat on God. And he's just saying, you can't have your feet in both pastures. You can't pursue your selfish passions and ambitions. You can't pursue the things that create injustice and also pursue God. We are called to something different. Who do you want to be friends with? Who do you want to be friends with? God or the world? And the challenge is, what level of cheating on God is okay. The answer is none. Our selfish passions damage our relationships and our society. When we flirt with the world, we cheat on God. And then we get to this question, what is the solution? And we read in verses 6 to 10, the call of James. And this is where it gets personal. This is where James speaks to me. And he speaks to you. And as we interact with the great issues of injustice in the world, I want to say to you, The Bible teaches that there is there is a brokenness, there is the work of the dark, the darkness of the enemy in the systems of the world. But the call is continually to me. The call is continually to to you to get our hearts set right with God. What do we do with all of this? Verse six. But but He God gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Here's the call. So what do we do? Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And he will lift you up. Third, humility 
is the path to receive God's grace and heal our pain. This is the path, humility. First, the humility of Jesus Christ, and then us following him, walking lives of humility. He gives us more grace. James returns us to the story. Jesus, here's the solution, leaving his place of comfort, leaving his place of glory, and walking among us because he genuinely loves us. Jesus, showing compassion, even to those who the world would say were not deserving of his time, even the untouchables. Jesus, calling out sin and inviting repentance from everyone, including those in power. Jesus, in the midst of being murdered, forgiving those who were doing it, us included. Jesus, rising from the dead, breaking the curse of the enemy, inviting us to a new and better way. Humility is the path, humble repentance, and active forgiveness. This is how the cycle of injustice is broken in this world when person by person by person humbly repents and actively forgives. James says, submit yourself to God. The quarrels around you are because you are quarreling with God. Submit yourself to God. Reaffirm his lordship in your life. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. When Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, he, he severely, severely hindered the power of Satan in this world. You don't need a sword. You just need to resist. When the enemy rises up, those wrong impulses resist and he will flee. Come near to God and he will come near to you. He says, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Stop standing in both fields. Stop pointing your finger and blaming everybody else. Look inside your heart. Recognize the brokenness within. And then he says, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to, to gloom. The things we're laughing about, the things that bring us joy, are so often those very things that in God's eyes we should be mourning. One commentator points out that in the Old Testament, God's people are called to grieve over three things. And I believe this is a good call on us today. First and foremost, start by grieving your sin. Grieve the things that you have done to offend God. Secondly, grieve the sin of others and the impact it is having on their lives. And third, grieve when there is damage. Grieve when property and people are hurt and damaged because of sin. And he says at the end, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Humble repentance and active forgiveness. God gives more grace. I've been personally, I've personally felt a little closer to this story because my parents and my older brother live in Minneapolis. And I got a note from one of them that just, just brought, brought this all to the table, I think, in a really good way. My brother wrote, I keep telling our kids that this is why people need Jesus and that this is not a simplistic response. There may be this response as I'm teaching through this passage. It's like, Jeremy, pay attention to what's going on. You're still just calling people to humble themselves before God and give their lives to Jesus. Are you sure that's enough? My brother writes, we won't be able to break out of these cycles until people can see that the offense that I have, uh, that I have done naturally to God is far greater than anything that anyone has ever done for me. And the forgiveness that I've received from him is far greater than any I would ever need to offer to anyone else for any offense. And he says, I say this with the full knowledge that I don't know how I'd respond if somebody had just burned down my house or hurt someone I love. But I do know that without Jesus, I wouldn't have a chance of responding with grace zero. (laughs) And so we're returned at the end of this passage to that familiar story of the prodigal son. His pride took him away from his father and brought damage to his household and his family and the world beyond. 
But when he returned in humility, the father ran to him. When he drew near to God, God drew near to him and said, yes, I invite you. I will make you a child of my house once again. The powerful call in this passage for whatever evil brings ill to our world is to return to Jesus with all of our hearts and to invite people to do the same. So where are you at? Perhaps you've spent this week watching the news feeds, thinking about how everybody else needs to change. What am I doing with this? Am I hanging on to my pride, blaming the brokenness in my life and my society and my world on others, or will I do my part? Will you do your part? Will you respond? Will you submit to God? Will you follow his lead in bringing his kingdom? Let me land with some on-ramps, then I'll pray as we transition into a time of communion. First, don't hide your desires from God. Ask and trust him to fulfill them. Put them in his hands. Second, don't be enticed by what the world offers. Choose the reward of God. Step out of the place where your foot's in both fields. Jump into God's field. Lastly, don't nurture your pride. Humble yourself and let God lift you up. So, Father, we come and we submit ourselves to you once again. God, there is nothing, there, there's nothing that we have done that makes us worthy of your love, makes us worthy of your acceptance. It is all because of your son, Jesus Christ. God, the results of how we live naturally are evident to see brokenness, destruction, death. But God, you have come that we may have life and have it to the full. May we repent. May we forgive. May each of us, God, do our part by admitting our part and walking in a better way. Even in this time as we remember your broken body and your shed blood. God, would you renew our hearts? Would you show us your grace, fill us with your forgiveness that we could have the strength by your Holy Spirit to extend the same to others. We thank you. We bless your name. Amen.